Office. I'm here as part of the YIGF project with ChildNet International. Um, and this is the discussion that we're going to be having today uh, surrounding online anonymity, freedom of expression, and internet governance. So last year in Baku, uh, the team discussed, uh, conducted a workshop entitled Social Media, Young People, and Freedom of Expression. And some of the conclusions which arose from the discussion were that anonymity gives power, that it can offend, but that it also gives people a voice, and that it can aid freedom of expression. Uh, but at the same time, it can provide a mask which encourages people to behave differently uh, for, for the worse or for the better. Uh, so that was the foundation from which we uh, built this year's discussion. And we think it's particularly relevant to the IGF sub-theme, human rights, freedom of expression, and information. Um, so in preparation for the IGF at summer camp this year, we defined anonymity as interacting online without revealing who you are. So this is our working definition, which we're going to be using throughout this workshop. But obviously, if anyone has any other opinions on this, um, we're going to be exploring, exploring varying perspectives on what anonymity is. Um, and we're very interested to hear that, because other perspectives is really what's quite key here as part of the multi-stakeholder discussion that the IGF is. Um, we're looking for a broad range of perspectives so we can have a very broad discussion in this workshop and that's what we're aiming for, a broad discussion on the issues that we've raised in the title and thus hope to increase everyone's understanding about uh, the topics, that, the topics um, that, that we're introducing here so, or investigating here. So I must stress that uh, especially as, as young people that this is our experience and our perspective, same with the industry panelists and our civil society representatives. Um, it's, it's their perspectives. So uh, that, uh, we're all limited in the fact that we can only talk about how we perceive things. So just to, uh, to put that out for everyone. Um, so quickly, the structure of the workshop. Uh, I'll first, uh, I'm going to um, introduce everyone. And everyone's uh, going to be talking, the team are going to be talking about uh, the survey that we conducted this summer, uh, which we're going to be uh, referencing throughout this uh, workshop. And then I'm gonna, we're going to uh, ask all our panelists the benefits of anonymity and its relationship with freedom of expression, followed by a five to ten minute reflection where we'll welcome questions from the floor. Uh, then we're going to talk about the challenges anonymity poses with specific consideration to internet governance. Finally, a longer discussion at the end and we hope to get uh, lots of feedback there. And then um, I'm going to make some concluding remarks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists um, and just uh, for brevity, I'd like you to stand up, give a wave if you like, um, when I uh, say your name. So to begin with, the members of the YIGF project is here. That's the Youth Internet Governance Forum project. Uh, Matthew Jackman, 18 years old. Jad Passmore, 17 years old. <laughs> Mikaia Gordon, 15 years old. And uh, Jadine Reese Gardner, 15 years old. Um, we're all from the United Kingdom. Um, I'm Nicola Douglas, just for those of you who are uh, coming in now, I'm 18 years old as well. Um, and to um, introduce our other youth participants, uh, we have Vivian Lo Chan Yi from Hong Kong, uh, who's here with us from NetMission. Ella Ho, also from Hong Kong, and here with NetY. Uh, Luis Ivan Quende, a programmer, entrepreneur, and the advisor to uh, the Vice President of the European Commission. And Elena Valman uh, from the Netherlands, who is a, reading international history and is a master's student at London School of Economics. Um, um, we'll clap at the end. We, we've, got a lot of, we've got a few more panelists to get through yet. So um, industry panelists now, uh, we welcome Simon Milner, Director of Policy in the UK and Ireland for Facebook, um, Anna Lucia Lenis, who's the Policy Lead for Google in Colombia, Peru and Ecuador, um, Nigel Hickson, the Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement for Europe for ICANN, um, and that's it for industry, civil society now, uh, Donny Boo from Indonesia, who's here with us from ICT Watch. And uh, finally, last but definitely not least, Marianne Franklin, uh, who's the chair of the Internet Rights and Principles uh, Commission. And uh, <laughs> for those of you who didn't know, um, and uh, for also uh, related with Goldsmiths University. Uh, we'd also like to mention Hannah Broadbent, uh, who's going to be our remote moderator today, hopefully bringing in some remote participants to the discussion to further increase perspective, uh, which is always helpful. I think we'll all agree. Uh, so now um, I'm going to hand over to the rest of the team who are going to talk about the survey that we conducted this summer. Um, and Jadine, I think you're going to begin. Um, we designed a survey to explore global opinions on anonymity, freedom of expression, and internet governance. The survey was conducted in three phases of discussion, getting the ideas down, and then finalizing them. 
Through an elimination process, we accumulated key questions that we thought suited our theme. The survey was promoted through ChildNet's international contacts and was open for a month. Open questions were included in the survey, blended with some closed ones to enable respondents to express themselves, a key element of our theme. In total, 1,382 people took part in our online survey. 50% of the respondents were 13 to 18 years old, and 40% were 19 to 35, and a further 10% were over 36 years old. There were responses from across 68 countries, and the highest of which came from Finland, the United Kingdom, China, and Mexico, and India. Other countries that took part included Afghanistan, Germany, Peru, and the United, um, United States. The results of our survey show that almost 65% of the respondents had interacted anon anonymously online in the past year, whilst the other 35% they had either they either had not participated on, in anonymous acts or they did not know if they had. So we all admit and accept that anonymous use on the internet is now commonplace. And this was revealed in our survey with two thirds saying that they'd acted anonymous, anonymously in the last year. But further to this, uh, actually a third of our respondents admitted that they actually used false names to achieve anonymity, which is extremely interesting. However, this you know, raises the question of trust, and does this breed a culture of distrust with anonymous use? We also found that there are um, many different methods of online communication, um, with the most common ones being um, leaving anonymous comments on services and using a service that you don't have to sign up for. We found from the survey that people use anonymous sites for two main reasons, and then obviously a lot of other reasons, but the main reasons were to protect personal information. So 65% of the respondents said that's why they were using anonymous sites. And the second was to be safe or to feel safer. So perhaps we can see that there is perhaps a, a false feeling that anonymity is complete security and complete protection. But to you know, everyday users, anonymity provides the security and the privacy they're looking for. So protecting personal information and feeling safer were the two things that anonymity brought to our respondents. We also found that um, respondents would feel they can express themselves more freely online if they're anonymous, so um, without having fear of repercussions or to face consequences of their actions because of what they say online. And we found that nearly two-thirds said they uh, would be more likely to say what they wanted online if they were anonymous. Okay, so obviously with that, if they're feeling they can say things more freely, that does leave, uh, or lead to the kind of flip side of anonymous use, which is the negative side. And the abusive side of anonymous um, use. And so we found that 71%, which is a really quite high number, which uh, I'll come back to as well, felt that people were nastier if they were using uh, anonymous sites. If they felt they were nastier. So that's an, a negative effect from anonymous use. And actually, 37%, 37% of the people said that they had actually received abuse from anonymous sites. And 25%, so that's one quarter of the respondents, admitted that they would actually be, would feel they would actually be nastier online. And th this comes back to a statistic we'll mention in a moment, which is that actually 86% of the people um, still believe that anonymous use and anonymous sites are crucial, you know, possibly stretching into the sh should they be a right online. So it's interesting that these people highlight that there are abuses from anonymous use, but then they still see the necessity for anon anonymity online. And just delving again into these negative reasons for anonymity, because there are quite a few which we've discovered uh, through our survey. Um, uh, reasons such as bullying, hate speech, sexual harassment, identity theft, and the spreading of false information and rumours. Um, we found that um, the percentage of people that thought that um, people were more abusive when they're anonymous online um, was more prevalent in the younger age brackets, um, with peaks on our graphs at 84% in the 16 to 18 year category. And um, there's a very de um, clear decline after that in people that agreed with the statement um, as the age ranges um, goes up to 36 years plus. But as always, we can't forget the positive implications of anonymous use. So, and, and half, or well, 50% of our respondents actually said that they saw good 
from an uh, anonymous use, and they gave various different you know, examples, help and advice. They actually felt they could give compliments more easily because they weren't attached to them, which is you know, that's a great thing as well. Um, privacy, they could speak their mind, they could have a voice, and also to the extent for human activists, they could criticize governments. So they all kind of tie under the, the kind of bracket of freedom of, freedom of expression, which obviously is hugely linked to anonymous use, how people feel more free online. Um, and also, if you've missed any of the stuff we said and you want to find out more about the survey, there are 50 copies on the door out. So, but we're just trying to introduce the ideas and the findings we found from our survey, which we'll use throughout this workshop. So to summarize the points that we found, um, the majority of people felt that it's important to allow people to be anonymous online if they, if they wish to be. And supporting this statement, we had 86% of our respondents agree with it. So as in the offline world, we control what information we share with different people. And anonymity can be a way of, of separating the personal information you might share with family or friends from the information you might share with someone you don't know, say a stranger. That is on. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, everyone. I think uh, it's very important to, I, I quite like the idea, actually, it's something Matthew mentioned, but the idea of random acts of kindness on the internet. We're going to go into focus about, you know, uh, positives um, later on. Uh, first of all, I'm going to begin with some introductory questions, um, but just, just to reiterate the fact that uh, we'll be referencing the survey throughout, and again, it is by the door if you'd like a copy at the end. I'll say it again, because we've got 50 copies there, and we, we'd like them all to go, so do, do pick one up on the way out. Um, so uh, just to begin with some introductory questions, I'm going to uh, say three, you can answer all, um, and this is directed to our youth panelists, so you can answer all three or you can answer just one. Um, and I'm going to come to Vivian first actually, so just to say the questions, how do you define anonymity? What does anonymity mean to you in practice? And do you feel that you can be completely anonymous online? Yeah, hello, I'm Vivian from NetMission, and I think anonymity means that I don't have to reveal any personal information online, so that I can be nobody in the internet. I can be whatever person that I want. And it means that I can do something that I don't want to, to do in the reality, or something that I want to do in the reality, but I was confined by some various factors. For example, like I feel bad for my school policy, but yet as a good student, I cannot blame the school directly or express my feelings to it. So if I go online and be anonymous, I can actually leave a comment in my school website so that they will understand what I feel bad about without really knowing who I am. But however, I don't think that I can be completely anonymous online. Even though I hide all my information, like my name, my sex, my um, uh, personal email address, etc. Still, I believe there are professional technicians who can track my IP address and track all the information that I left online. So probably it's my opinion on these three questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vivian. Um, just, I think we'll come to uh, Lewis. Would you like to say anything about this right now? Um, come to Lewis if he wants to say anything, and I know Olina definitely does. So. Yeah, so um, I think anonymity is more like uh, my, that my online activity cannot be tracked or logged in any like technical way. So when I browse a website, for example, I, uh, the ISP or the government or the website doesn't know that uh, that account is um, just linked to me. Uh, what was the second question? Sorry? Um, so what does it mean in practice? Oh, what does it mean yeah, in practice? In practice, yeah, in practice means exactly that, that when I log in on a website, for example, uh, the website doesn't uh, like track down my activity to my person. Um, and I don't feel really anonymous because, uh, I mean, when you are, for example, creating a fake account in a, in a, you know, in an incognito tab in Chrome or whatever browser you are using, um, so the website doesn't know who you are because you are creating a fake account with a, you know, with an incognito tab or window or whatever you are using. But your ISP is still like tracking every single HTTP request you are, you are doing to their servers. So it's like the ISP or the government, you know, with the NCA scandal, it is very clear that they are tracking us down. So, uh, so the website may not really know who you are really, but the ISP does, and the government in the end also does, in the case of the US. So I don't feel anonymous in any way. 
Okay, and Erwin, would you like to answer some of those questions? Yeah, I will answer to say something about defining anonymity. I think if you talk about it, it's really important that you realize you're talking about a relationship. You're only anonymous in relation to somebody else. So, for example, if you're on a forum, you may, might be anonymous to the other users of this forum, but you're probably not to the moderators or the people, the owners of the website. So, you really need to be aware of that. and. That's why I feel you're never really anonymous, but Louis said you can always, almost always be traced back to you. So I think if you talk about being anonymous, you really depend on the website who's protecting your privacy. So you ha always have to trust, in a sense, somebody with your information. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to come to Jack now. I think you have a comment on this. Um, for me, I believe anonymity is an evasion of accountability and an evasion of the consequences um, of our actions. It sort of provides a mask um, of freedom and a mask for confidence, um, which can be used for good um, in some cases and can give someone the power to change a personality and change human behavior online. Um, I don't believe you can be completely anonymous online. Anything and everything you do online has the potential to be traced through data aggregation, amongst other means. And with advancements in technology um, in this day and age, and the rate they've been evolving in the 21st century, I believe there will become a time um, where nothing's hidden, and users will all be stripped of anonymity and sort of exposed to themselves. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Jadine, would you like to make a comment on this? Um, I define anonymity as using a service without a substantial amount of people knowing your true identity and at times without accountability. Um, I don't use any anonymous services, but in practice it would definitely mean to me someone who I couldn't identify. Um, I don't feel that you can be completely anonymous because you can be traced by using an IP address for example and many people who are in touch with the technological side of things have those around it and but I think that people um, who wouldn't bother to investigate who you are, if you were anonymous, yeah, you could be completely anonymous to them. So, yeah. Thanks, Jadine. I think what we, uh, the sort of vibe I was getting from the panelists there is that so anonymity in itself does not exist. We can be traced. Uh, we're all aware that there is data out there about us and that you know, the government, it's available there for people to find out about us. But at the same time, from a pers uh, perspective of young people, I think that it's been identified that maybe, as uh, Alina was saying, that we are not anonymous to other people on the service, that we are, remain anonymous to other people on the service. Um, so that you know, if there is a case of cyberbullying going on, you're not necessarily able to find out who that is. Um, who that is that is sending you the on anonymous abuse because as Jadine was saying we are not uh, technologically advanced enough uh, because I personally don't know uh, the second thing about IP addresses I'm sure you all do I personally don't but um, I think I think it's an interesting an interesting distinction to make and I think it's something we should all keep in mind in, in that nature of anonymity um, in that yes it doesn't technically exist but uh, it, in some people's perspective it, it definitely is there and it, it is a problem um, so uh, I think we'll move on to the first sort of section of our discussion, which is the benefits of anonymity and its relationship with freedom of expression. So I'm going to start. 65% uh, of the respondents in our survey said that they chose to be anonymous uh, in order to protect their personal information. And uh, sort of to carry on from that, um, I'm asking the panelists, why might you choose to be anonymous instead of using your real name? So Alina, I think you have something to say here. Um, yeah, I wanted to say something about uh, young people, but then more maybe about uh, in the section 19 to 23, because in countries where social change and political change happens, it's most of the time it's really young countries. So young people can bring about change. And then I think the internet is nowadays a really important means for them to communicate their ideas, to be criti critical of the go their government, and to bring about change. So in that sense, it's really important for them to be aware of the fact that it's always, almost always possible for the government to trace down who they are. And there are so many cases of bloggers being arrested. So I think that this awareness should be there, but then if they are aware of that, I think they can still be anonymous to some extent, that they cannot be traced and they can really express their opinions and can bring about a change. Thank you very much, Lena. I think uh, we're going to come to Vivian now. Would you like to say something about this? Yeah. I'd like to pass this time to Ella. Do you want to say something? Um, personally, hello, hello. Um, personally, 
I agree that, you know, I would want to be anonymous instead of using my real name because, first of all, you know, if I'm anonymous, then obviously people wouldn't know who I am on the internet. Like, I am able to just, you know, speak out, you know, on my own opinions and just say whatever I want on the internet without having anyone know who I really am. And personally, I feel that if I, you know, if I were anonymous and if I use my real name, I would feel that, you know, I, I'm being exposed on the internet. Like, someone knows my name and, and someone knows... Uh, that this is my opinion. So, you know, basically, uh, you know, I would rather be anonymous than, you know, you, use my word. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I think we're going to come to Matthew now. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, so as you said, you know, people want to protect their personal information, but I kind of see it as, as more the kind of power and, and the security aspect. And also, you know, it's simple, and there's there's almost no stress to anonymity. There's no worry about your your personal reputation because it's it's not necessarily you. You're you're just kind of blank, and, and the words come out. So I like to kind of put this in a, a kind of if you imagine internet use in a kind of inter interview situation, and you imagine a kind of face-to-face -face interview is real name usage, and you're judged on how you look, your image, everything you say is judged. But a kind of anonymous interview would be over text and you're sitting in your massage chair and it's all very nice and very simple. Okay, so you see the, you see the positives for the anonymous use, you know, it's stress-free, okay, it's good. And, and, you're, and there's no prejudice, there's no kind of, you're not judged on anything because it's just the words you're saying in the interview. But then the face-to-face -face is, is more authentic, it's, it's more real, okay, and you're judging everything, so you want everything to be the best it can for yourself. And you'll notice, I guess, in this workshop, when you pass the mic around, you will turn around to have a look at the person who's speaking. You know, you, you don't just listen to their words, you look at them, you judge them, then you start making interpretations. So that, that to me is, you know, the kind of distinctions there. And, and I, I, see, I see the positives why people choose anonymous use, but the trust issues which are raised with that are very, you know, important. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matthew. Do you want to make another comment there? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, what I noticed in this poem, which is really interesting, I think that we are talking about the reality and that the offline world is maybe more real, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think your, your online identity can just be a bigger part of you as your offline identity. They may be different, but they're still a part of you. So I have to say that I don't think um, it's more real. It is just as real. Internet is a part of our reality, actually. Do you want to respond to that, Matthew? Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. There you go. Okay, it's, it's interesting because I think you, you, when you use an anonymous site, you, site sorry, you kind of start afresh. Okay, you start... It, obviously, it's you. You know, I'm formulating the ideas that I'll put in an anonymous site, but I'm starting completely blank. Yes, I will form an identity in the kind of anonymous site I use if I, if I go back to it, but essentially I'm, I'm standing clean, so I'm not really using any of myself. Um, yes, it's, the, you know, I, I, I agree there's a lot of connections between there, but I think that anonymity kind of removes you. It, it makes you, the behavioral changes make you think in a different way and act in a different way on that anonymous site, which is, yeah. Can you agree with that, Alina? Is that something that you see? You see the point of, or would you like to respond again? I'm quite enjoying this, so, okay. <laughs> Going on across me, so it's, it's wonderful. It's good to, good to get the discussion in. So I think if, we, if we've finished up with that question, then I'll, I'll move on to sort of looking at sort of more positive uses of anonymity. Uh, we've um, seen some, they've been mentioned on the table, but I think, uh, Mikhail, you definitely have something to say here, so. Well, positive anonymity was something that we did look at on our survey, and we found out that over half of our respondents have seen anonymity being used positively online. And more 16 to 18 year olds have seen positive anonymity being used online than actually experience negative abuse directly. And one quote that we did get was from a female from Mexico which it, who is aged 13 to 15 and she said that she uses anonymity to stand up for someone. And in another male from Finland also in the same age bracket said people often come to help anonymously when someone is being bullied by someone else who is also on an anonymous account. And I think that this does show that being anonymous gives people the confidence to stand up for others where they might not have done in real life. And also, um, it gives people like the kind of confidence that they might not um, normally have. 
and another male from the US, age 26 to 35, said, I am trans but I'm not out on the internet. When I talk about trans issues, I don't want it to be connected with the same person that other people know. And I think that um, this is because anonymity allows people to seek help and advice about subjects that they are embarrassed about or don't want people in their personal life offline to actually know about. So thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Michaela. I think we definitely get uh, anonymity does give more confidence. And um, I think Ella also has something to say about this, if that's okay. Or uh, Vivian, if either one of you wish to respond. Um, I definitely agree with, with what she said. I feel that you know, teenagers nowadays, like in real life, they would feel you know, uh, completely afraid of being judged you know, on whatever they say. So anonymity really helps them to uh, have that confidence online. So basically, you know, they get confidence from you know, seeing stuff online, unconscious to often where they would you know, feel afraid. And also, um, for instance, if you know, a teenage girl, she, she, you know, she suffers from you know, personal uh, problems, like for some she has problems in school, then she would be able to tell uh, people online, like anonymous people online, maybe chat rooms or discussion forums without, uh, you know, having fear of being you know, judged, basically. Thanks very much for that, Ella. I, I think it's definitely a, a point to make that that fear of being judged is is always there, and it's very prevalent uh, for young people, especially when it comes to societal norms and um, things and what you do and do not feel comfortable saying in front of your peers in an offline environment. may be something that you feel um, incredibly com comfortable saying in an on online environment if you are anonymous. Um, or indeed, even if you are not, as, as the case may be, as some people do want uh, those opinions to be linked back to them. Um, so, uh, I think uh, uh, where we've been neglecting our other panelists, so I'm going to come to you now. Um, how does anonymity impact freedom of expression? Um, so, uh, we're looking for positive uses here, maybe some global case studies that you could possibly um, and possibly offer uh, to the discussion. So I'm going to come first to uh, Marianne. Uh, so just to to recap, um, <laughs> sorry, I was tweeting. I was tweeting. Um, sorry, uh, I was sort of listening. I can't yeah. actually talk. Yeah, no, it's, I'm sure. I'm sure you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so anonymity in positive all years in the expression and uh, uh, positive voices. Yes, um, I suppose I, my, my example for today, so I'll give you the first half of the example from the positive side. I um, have written about this young woman called the once homeless girl, uh, 16 years old when her family found themselves um, homeless through the mortgage, the, uh, the crisis, the economic crisis in 2008, very unfortunate. She was able to go online, make contact with people through a gifted mobile phone, Blogging eventually is the once homeless girl. In other words, quite anonymously, because homelessness is a shameful condition for her, for many people. It's also one of the many forgotten communities. So this allowed her, through this persona, to discuss many issues about being homeless and what happens to you when you come from a good background, as she said, and in this terrible position. So I just call it having an avatar, having another identity online, allowed her to say this. And that was extremely powerful for her, and the blog became extremely um, significant, and Huffington Post picked it up, and I will continue the story later. Thank you very much. So I, I assume we're going to get the challenges, the challenges a bit later. Oh, yes. oh good, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, Donnie, if I could just come to you now. I, I know that uh, you, uh, your organization um, does some work specifically with human rights, and I wondered if you could give us any uh, perspective on how an anonymity impacts, impacts this. Yes, yeah, so um, first of all, I want to say that anonymity, more or less, is uh, is part of the right to be unavailable in, in the internet, because because this is a hyper-connected world. So, so we have, we have to we have to right to be unavailable, but it uh, depends on the in in the in the use of the uh, anonymity itself, because we know that there's uh, two reasons why people do anonymity or why people are the, the, uh, online anonymously. First, because they want to, uh, to be freedom of consent and the second is freedom of uh, responsibility. So for the people who choose to be uh, anonymous because they want to, you know, freedom of consent, well, it's, it is, it's good because it's part of the freedom of the online because it's part of the human life. But if people want to do online, uh, to do anonymous because they want freedom of uh, responsibility, that's very bad. Uh, sometimes uh, the people they just you know just think that anonymous is not is not good. For example, for for 
for the, uh, some cases in Indonesia, uh, if you if you speak or if you voicing about corruption, for example, or you have information about corruption and you're like a whistleblower and you put your name on all your data clearly on the internet and will harm you your or your family. So you have to you have to share it uh, anonymously. But then because uh, because the people have power then they can, you know, persuade the mass media to say that anonymous is bad. So the challenge is not only how we, we can become anonymous, but the challenge is how the people understand, how the people, we can get to educate the people how to choose uh, which one information is legitimate and credible and which one is not. Because the press information, the garbage information not only because it's anonymous. Sometimes the mass media also giving the the press information. So it's not about anonymity or not. It's because uh, it's about the credibility of the source of information. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just I'm aware of my time, and I just ask you a, a question. I'd say for later, but just a quick question for the both of you. If you, you could just give a, a one word, brief, common answer. What? Do you think anonymity is necessary um, for freedom of expression? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, Donnie, do you have anything for it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, a strong I, yes from that side then. And, and I'd like to give a brief uh, comment as well. I, I think I welcome your comment, Nigel. Thank you very much. For, for everyone who doesn't know and forgotten since I mean, the start, I'm aware Nigel hasn't spoken. No, Vice President. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the, the answer is yes. But the, but the comment is, if we go back to before the internet, and the internet is the world, the in cyberspace, you know, let's forget this, stupid term. The internet is real. You know, this is the reality of today. My generation, when we wanted to protest, we didn't, you know, we didn't have the internet. We went to rallies, we went to demonstrations, we went to the streets, we went to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and we stood up and we shouted at politicians and we shouted at anyone that would listen. And yes, we wanted to be an anonymous at some time. We didn't necessarily want people to know who we were. Other times, yes, we wanted to give our names because we wanted to represent an organisation or a society. So surely this is the balance that's a reality. I think that's a, a very interesting point you make, Nigel, that uh, sort of, we do want to be anonymous, maybe if you're, if you're politicised, you want to be anonymous to the powers that be, perhaps, but uh, to the other people that you're trying to connect with, I think it's, it's important that your name is known, I think. Uh, this was mentioned in our workshop earlier this week, um, workshop 19, uh, was talking about something else with uh, Louise Bennett, so we've, we've taken on board some ideas from that, and I should be, uh, I'd be welcome any comments from the floor later. Um, so um, I'm aware that uh, all this discussion of anonymity maybe has been perturbing some of our panelists because uh, uh, I think we're going to come to industry representative Simon now. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you how you make provisions to encourage freedom of expression because we have heard a lot about um, have heard a lot about how anonymity is uh, necessary. Uh, anonymity is necessary to encourage it, but I think we'd like some thoughts from you on this. Um, so, uh, I think most people here will know that one of the decisions Mark Zuckerberg made in the very early days of Facebook is it would be a real name environment. Um, and actually, I think without that, Facebook wouldn't be what it is today. It wouldn't have grown to be a community of over a billion people um, because actually people like to connect with people they know in the real world. Um, and that's what makes Facebook um, such a strong success. But it's also an incredible platform for freedom of expression. And that's partly because of some of the tools we provide. So people can create a page about something they really care about um, and uh, can communicate with millions of people by that page without necessarily revealing their personal identity. Uh, and that's something that people find very powerful within Facebook. So any suggestion that Facebook's real name policy has inhibited its ability to be a platform for freedom of expression is clearly proven wrong by the number of campaigns and causes that have been promoted via our platform. I think that's a, a definite point to make there. Um, Anna Lucia, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that the, the anonymity is, uh, is part of the freedom that we have to, uh, and, and the options that we have in the internet and all the tools that the different companies are providing on all the freedom that gives us the internet to express ourselves. So then we have the opportunity to, to, check, to decide how I want to express myself, or, and it depends. Sometimes I want to express something to my parents, but not to my friends. 
or some, it, it depends on the, it, it, it's, a, it's a reflect of, of the real world, but and our real relations, and, and sometimes I want to share the picture or it's something with my friends, uh, and I want to spread that with me, I want to look, and sometimes I, I'm very disappointed, and I, or I want to, for example, uh, search for medical information, but maybe I don't want to, uh, to suppose like, like me, maybe I want to be like an incognito or a, or use a pseudonym or uh, something different. So this is a, this is a feeling that the, that we should have in the internet. And it's not, a, and, and I think that we need to think all the time in the balance between the individual freedom, the civil liberties, and additionally the, the, the protection of the citizens, uh, and sometimes uh, I, 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 I totally agree that we have a huge concern, the issue about uh, the surveillance of the, or what is, what is happening with my uh, data, but there's a lot of issues that we need to, 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 to analyze, and, and every circumstance is different. So it's, a, it's something like between a balance in the regulations and the freedom of expression and the rights. So we have to consider all of this and we have to learn. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just briefly going to come to some more of our panel members, but I'm aware there are questions from the floor, so I'll take you in about, uh, we'll give it a few minutes or so. Uh, do we have any remote participants, participants that want to make a comment, Anna? Just nothing at the moment? No comments yet. Okay. Um, so just, I'm, Anna Lou mentioned briefly there, sometimes you want to use a synonym and sometimes you want to make comments as yourself. So I'm going to ask, uh, Jack and Jadine had some thoughts on sort of, can anonymity be used to help develop and support identity? Uh, for example, using a pseudonym or a fake name, uh, building a reputation for yourself online as someone who can be trusted, but not necessarily with a real name. So, uh, Jack, do you want to share some thoughts on this? Uh, well, the development and exploration of an identity is something that I think is becoming increasingly more important as technology evolves and sort of changes through the years. Um, and people that may be new to technology um, or services such as social networks like Facebook and Twitter um, will naturally take an online persona that may be slightly different to their real life so they can experiment and choose who they want to be. The only issue that may arise from this exploration is that anonymous services um, or the use of pseudonyms, for example, um, may give rise to an abusive user or um, as the mask of anonymity sort of cloaks human emotion as that isn't, that doesn't exist um, with anonymity online. Uh, I think it's Jodine, would you like to? Thanks. Um, I think it can, well, more so than I did before because I used to solely believe that if you're, un if you're using an unidentified viable username, then you can't possibly be developing your identity or just making another one. And I couldn't really see how just adding to your identity count added to the quality of or supported your true identity. However, upon getting the results of our survey, my opinion has differed. Firstly, now I have interpreted from the results that people find their true identity through exploring online and some may want to do that anonymously. Also, a female from Sweden in the 36 plus category addressed her pseudonym as that name is me, perhaps more so than a legal name. I see that as interesting because it shows just because your parents have given you a name that they may or may not want you to, may or may not want your true identity to stem from, it doesn't mean to say that that is the real you. And so some may feel they can develop their true identity much more freely and without judgment through being anonymous. Uh, thanks, Jadine. Um, I think we're going to come to Jack and then Alina, and then I'm quite aware of my time, so I'm just going to add in another question really quickly, but you can come back to it. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so, uh, just Jack then. And uh, Jack, I think if you want to, you can uh, sort of answer the question now about uh, using anonymous sites to avoid accountability and the potential consequences of sharing your views. So, uh, just... Oh, well, I'll come back to the, um, the question that we just had about um online exploration of identity um, and I'll, I'll come to our survey now because we have some amazing results um, that, um, that were shown from this. 65% of um, people said they are anonymous online to protect their personal information um, which is great because then you get to avoid data aggregation because that isn't always the safest way to explore identity by putting your personal information out there. And also 29% of people said it was to protect their reputation, so obviously from employers or a professional capacity there. And furthermore, 36% of, um, of people use an account with a false name. 
and these results could suggest that people are using anonymity online to explore their identity and have the chance to be someone different and act or behave in a different way online to how they usually would in real life. And we've got a couple of quotes, some from our survey, because we gave people the chance to sort of express themselves rather than just tick boxes and have statistics. And this one's from a female in Finland in the 16 to 18 year category. Um, she said, teenagers are still trying to figure out who they want to be, and being anonymous on the internet is a great way to try different social roles safely. And I couldn't agree more. It's all about safety online. And it's great. To, you can't, it, I haven't got a problem with being, being anonymous if you want to be. I think you should be allowed to be. As long as you're doing it safely, that's the key point. And uh, many people also mentioned that anonymity online is fun and should be fun and um, has the capacity to be um, fun. And uh, we have another quote from a male also in Finland in the 16 to 18 year old category um, who said it's fun to have a fictional identity for games. Um, and I agree with um, Xbox Live and things like that. Um, you do end up having your own little avatar on your own little person when you're online gaming. 31% um, of 16 to 18 year olds were anonymous online because it is fun, so that's 31% of all our younger users. And um, the higher percentages um, for this question were prevalent in the younger age brackets. I think what I really love about that is that there are so many different positive uses of anonymity. Obviously, we haven't quite focused on the negatives yet, but I think you know we've got the random acts of kindness. We've got um, the idea of being politicized and uh, expressing your opinion, uh, supporting uh, supporting causes that you agree with. Obviously, uh, Facebook provides for that in other ways. Um, but the the an idea that anonymity can perhaps do more so on other sites. Um, so. Yeah, I think everyone, I, I think we probably do have some comments from the floor by this point. Um, so I'm aware I have missed out some of the questions I intended to do, but um, oh, it's a little bit ad-libbing, isn't it? So uh, <laughs> let's go. Uh, who do I have from the floor? Um, I see someone at the back. Pippa, you're ready to run. Okay. Um, so someone at the back. Um, do I remember um, name, organization you're affiliated with. Uh, I'd speak up clearly because some of the mics are a bit low. Not working? Okay. Sorry. I'm just in the spirit of this motion. I have a few questions to understand the survey. Uh, was the survey just produced in English or you have also local version translated? Or is it uh, and there's a question regarding sexual identities, minorities and all this issue? Certainly, we like to say that anonymity, I mean, in principle, works for everyone. So, principle, you have or you don't. If you, if we don't have the anonymity as a principle, we cannot cope with all the negative side of not having it. If we have the principle, then we can work out how to balance rights. Because principles, ones, they are or they are not. But I'm really interested in knowing which kind of question we're addressing all the other minority issues that make people question of life or death to be in line with anonymous and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. I'll respond to uh, what you mentioned about the survey very briefly. Um, yes, it was translated into, I think, uh, five different languages, um, and I would imagine it w uh, Spanish probably was uh, the main other one because uh, Childnet is a, is a charity, a charitable organization, and um, it was through their contacts that they managed to find the people who uh, took their time to translate it, so um, uh, they're very grateful for those people for doing so. So, fortunately, we weren't able to get it in all languages, um, as anyone who works with translating will know that is an impossible task to do a lot of the time, unless you're like Facebook and have a billion users who can translate for you at any time, but I don't think Childlet quite has that many contacts yet, um, unfortunately. But um, is there any comments um, from the floor? Uh, uh, come over here. Um, again, name an organization you're affiliated with. My name is Jorge Luis I am a Mexican journalist. I am a part of the Freedom House delegation in, in this conference. Um, congratulations for the panel. 
I just um, would like to make a quick point in regards to anonymity. Um, this is, of course, a right. We have to, to have the right of anonymity on, on the net. But in certain parts of Mexico and Latin America, anonymity is a matter of life or death. Particularly because uh, citizens who are uh, Twitter in using Twitter to to report about drug violence can be killed, and they are protecting actively their identity. They are using all tools available to protect anonymity, um, to in, in Google vote, in in Android phones, or um, whatever. So for them, I think that's that's crucial. Um, I'd agree with you. For some people in the world, anonymity is crucial. It protects them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it was definitely something that arose last year. I was participating in a workshop um, about Speak No Hate, and we were um, talking to a youth blogger there who uh, was uh, very shared with us stories about how anonymity has saved his life on a number of occasions. Um, uh, do we have any other comments from the floor? Uh, one over here, one over here, uh, possibly one over there. Uh, we'll see if we have time. Can, can we please keep it brief? Because I'm aware there's so many people, but um, please do go ahead. Rita Carr from the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany. Um, in German law, we have laid down in the privacy and data protection law the right to anonymity and synonymity. So I was wondering whether you can extract the figures for Germany if you've got respondents from Germany if that's related to the legal situation. And the other question is whether you have knowledge about the legal situation in other countries where there are similar laws, like in Germany. Thank you. Sure, I'm, I'm sure we'd be delighted. I, I also was actually quite interested in the respondents from Germany because I was aware of the, uh, the situation there. Uh, so I think it would be definitely, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to compare on a country basis because we didn't get the same number of respondents. So we thought it was better to do it. Uh, age trends seem to really stick out more for us. And I think some of the trends that have been brought up so far have been very interesting indeed. Uh, I think we have a comment from the front row here, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Bodle, and I'm a college professor as well as a member of the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition. I'm really interested in this topic, and I'm really enjoying this. Um, this has been a great panel. Um, I wanted to share a paper called Want to Be on the Top, Algorithmic Power and the Threat of Invisibility on Facebook, The Threat of Invisibility. And the paper looks at edge rank on Facebook and how your friends uh, posts are filtered for you. So uh, what this researcher is finding, Tanya Butcher, is finding that uh, people are, try are negotiating the tension between being not paid attention to and also being anonymous. So I'm wondering if you found in your findings, in your survey, or in your own experiences this tension between being noticed uh, and being anonymous. And that might le lead you to kind of uh, decisions that you wouldn't want to have to make. I think that's an interesting comment. I, it calls into mind a quote from Oscar Wilde. I think he said something along the lines of, uh, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Um, particularly pertinent here. Alina, do you have a comment to make about, uh, in response to that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to you because then I feel that there is not a tension between being anonymous or be but it's attention about being invisible and being noticed. And being anonymous is something, I think, is really different from it because your identity on the internet can be anonymous but really visible as well because it's an, a different identity you create, which, as I said, is still a big part of you. And I wanted to say something in response to what we said, talked about um, on the right to anonymity, and I think that shows it, how the tension between businesses and government on this subject uh, can be really important because in a sense the right to anonymity should be, um, it's a government issue I think. Like maybe it should be a global law but in the end still now local governments are responsible to it. So in countries like Mexico where the government is, what he says, actually trying to interfere in that, I was just wondering how businesses should act in that sense because do they have to follow the law in this country and give up people's right to anonymity as well? Or should they be take a political stand and do not do that? And I think Helena just highlighted a very contentious issue there, um, which I think a lot of uh, a lot of companies may struggle with and businesses too. Um, 
No. I'm looking at the time, and it says 11.55. I think uh, a couple more comments from the floor uh, should be OK, because uh, um, we'll get some more discussion at the end of the workshop. But here and here, and that's the final two comments I'm taking for this bit section. I'll come to you at the end, um, I promise we timetable in some more discussions, so don't worry. Hey, uh, my name is Carmen, and I'm from Estonia, from the University of Bartha. I'm doing PhD on uh, internet and liability issues. Um, my comment is regards only the German legal system and also Dr. Robert Bottle's uh, comment uh, before me uh, that about the Germany and the anonymity there, that is a legal principle there. Uh, I think the Germany, German legal system is a very good example because they really have a lot of court cases regarding anonymity. Uh, there have been court cases relating teachers rating portals, uh, doctors rating portals and so forth. However, now when Facebook um, uh, enacted their last uh, privacy uh, rules on 2012, then German Data Protection Authority actually challenged it in the court because the uh, privacy rules have real names trade name policy in it. So Facebook kind of says that you can't be anonymous anymore, at least when you register to be a user, because when they find out that you provided false name, they will, uh, uh, you're obliged to present them a copy of photo ID. So just to give everybody a notice that this has been uh, in the court, right? the court first, um, first level it was ruled down. They said that, well, you can't apply German law because Facebook is situated in Ireland, in, in Europe, but uh, the authority has well, at least promised and publicly declared that they will, uh, they will go forward with it. So just um, so the Facebook is not really uh, anonymous, and so you can't really be uh, invisible anymore. Thank you very much. Um, that's a, it's an interesting comment. I think the German example is is a very good one to bring in for this issue. Um, and I'll go to our last comment from the floor, and then we're going to start the next section of our workshop, which will be uh, the challenges and limited poses. Hi, my name is uh, Caroline Tengia. I work for the Association for Progressive Communication in um, the Women's Rights Program of the organization. And we're working like since the past, um, the past three, four years on uh, a project that is really uh, focused on sexual rights and internet rights. And um, I just wanted to bring the input that like for the research that we've been doing and also like the recent survey that we've done with sexual rights activists, like anonymity is it, like comes as a major point of discussion and it's, it's extremely important for activists. Um, just wanted to respond to um, in, in regards to real name policies on Facebook. I think it hinders activis activism especially for uh, people that cannot be identified um, because it's a matter of life and death, actually. Uh, but that you still need, need to organize to, uh, and then communicate with others to, to, uh, demand, uh, to make their demands heard. Yeah, I think yeah. Our, our survey definitely reflected that uh, with uh, sort of the respondents who identified with the LGBT community uh, were saying that anonymity was a necessity for them and that in order to uh, to come out or to uh, just just talk about the issues that they didn't feel that they could talk about with their friends. Um, so that's in, in a more social situation, uh, but also on, on the level above that, um, just being an activist for the community itself um, and in countries where uh, holding holding such views is a matter again of, of life and death as as we seem to be returning to. So um, I'll end that part of the discussion there. Um, but uh, don't worry, I will uh, come to any more um, questions at the end. So just to begin section two then of the workshop, the challenges posed by anonymity and that this was specific consideration to internet governance. So um, I think we're going to come to uh, Alina first for the question that uh, how does anonymity impact on behavior online? Would you like to answer that, or shall we? No. No? OK. <laughs> that, that's one. Um, OK, in which case, Ella, I think you definitely would like to answer this question. Um, Ella, uh, in fact, Ella can tell you, because she's probably better better prepared than I am, so. Um, hello? Hello? Yeah. Um, it's pretty simple. I feel that um, anonymity, you know, how anonymity impacts um, behavior online is that um, some people, they may feel that, you know, when they're online, and and be anonymous, then they wouldn't be able to, you know, be identified for other people. And this leads to the point where they would, like, abuse anonymity. 
like they would say that because they don't know uh, because they know that people wouldn't know who they are then they, they will you know, you know abuse this and just you know do whatever they want or say whatever whatever they want on the internet and you know you know for instance bullying it, they would feel more comfortable to bully someone on the internet because you know you know they wouldn't you know get caught and stuff. Thanks very much, Al. Thanks very much, Al. I think um, Alina would like to respond to that one. So. Yeah, I remember I had something to say because um, I feel that anonymity online can do a lot of good things as well as bad things. But I think what is really important and also dangerous is a false sense of anonymity and what that does to people. So that's what I think is a big problem. People say something and they feel they're anonymous and they feel safe and then people find out and they're in a lot of trouble. So that's when I think the key issue here is still awareness about that anonymity online is virtually impossible still. So uh, we're getting the, the, the impossibility of an anonym, anonymity again. Um, so Matthew, I think you want to make a comment here. Yeah, no, no, no I'll, I'll say something here. Um, for me, anonymity does remove some of the kind of social norms um, and really it becomes a bit more spontaneous in what you say. It's, it's just how I, I view anonymity. I feel it's more a conscious stream of thought and I think less about the, the implications. So I say something that is probably more provocative and I think the gentleman at the front there was saying that what are the tensions and you know you want to be noticed so, so maybe anonymity provides that kind of platform to be a bit more provocative and thus you know you say things that maybe you know you don't actually feel attached to you but you do it to be noticed um, because you know it removes the kind of the restraint and the ethics and behavior does become in my opinion a bit more reactive um, with emotions rather than reason um, which you know guide your, guide your actions um, which were just my, my thoughts on that. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Marianne, <laughs> thought I'd surprise you again. So, yeah. Um, oh, good, good. Um, so, impacting on online okay. behavior. We got it this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, once homeless girl part two, we will now call her Nadia. Because as she became more confident and uh, more visible, because I'm enjoying this, this important distinction here, became more visible amongst the blogging community, she was contacted by a wonderful activist who's been doing um, homeless TV. So we met her in a large global city on the planet, which I will show her name for the moment, Anonymous, and uh, did a video of her. And that's how I discovered her. So here is her name, here is her face, here she was. So I became interested because this has been research I've been doing for some years and I organized an interview. Okay, so she tells me that as she became more prominent as one time as girl, she started to discover, she, this was on Facebook, she started to link up to Facebook, she got linked in. She was having friends appear that she'd never knew. So this is the sort of automated linking in that Facebook does. And this had some consequences she started to feel not so comfortable with. For instance, there were friends who weren't um, saying they were saying things she didn't like and someone else set themselves up as homeless girls so she immediately had this issue with her profile with her persona so we're not talking about anonymity so much as having another persona um, so she decided that she became more confident I'll be finishing in a minute um, that she would actually come out and actually tell the world who she really is because she wanted to advocate for homeless issues and this has been picked up by Huffington Post which insists of course you sign off or someone, or real, that I would change what real is. So of course now we know as Nadia, I will not give her last name because of the third part of the story that I want to talk about. Um, uh, so that's how far she got. She started to notice that she was being linked in automatically through these uh, mechanisms that social networking sites, commercial so social networking sites use to enhance the social networking, but also for market research. She started to notice that visibility, even though she was supposedly anonymous, had some sort of other layers you had not thought about. I know how to finish the story, but I'm not so sure where it will fit, so can I just leave it hanging at that point? We well, now know who she is, what she looks like, what her first name is. To be continued. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marion. Uh, that is, yeah, I'm, I'm excited now. I can't wait. Um, we'll definitely try and bring you, well, I'm definitely coming to you in the discussion at the end. Um, so, I mental note there. Um, so uh, I think that for that for that question, uh, the sort of how does it impact on on online behaviour? We we definitely had a lot of um, a lot of answers for that, and I think 
part of the part of the reason that uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, adopted the real name policy for Facebook is because um, he thought he, in some ways, um, and in lots of ways, it it combats a lot of these challenges and it um, it stops them effectively. Uh, it it removes some of the harms and anonymity can cause. I really should be able to pronounce this right by this point in the workshop. Um, so I'm going to turn to industry representatives now. Um, what are the challenges anonymity poses for industry and how do you personally meet these challenges? Obviously, Simon, you've talked about um, and you've talked about the real name, uh, the real name policy. If, if you'd like to, if you think there's anything else that you'd like to mention here, Nigel, uh, definitely coming for you because I know you have some interesting things. And um, Anna Lucia, is there anything, anything you'd like to mention here? Uh, anything? So yeah, do go um, on. So one thing that we changed recently on Facebook uh, was in regard to the ability of young people, including those of you who are under 18 on, uh, on this platform, to speak publicly. So we used to have a requirement that, oh, so we used to have an imposition that. Uh, anybody under 18 on Facebook, the maximum audience they could have was friends of friends. Um, and one of the things we were hearing from people is that that meant that their voice was restricted. So actually we were, we were not enabling them to be as visible as they might want to be on certain issues. So we've now changed that um, and young people 18 can post publicly. But what we also do is provide a lot of education around that to explain what that means. So if you are public, then that means other people can contact you. And you may get friend requests, and this goes to the point about Nadia, may get friend requests from people you don't know. Uh, and, that, and, and, that, and Facebook's policy and advice is to only accept friend requests from people you know in the real world. So we recognize that, that enabling a public voice for young people brings some challenges as well. And so not every safety organization has welcomed what we've done, uh, and, and we'll wait to see how it plays out uh, in practice. But I think I would say young people have, have definitely welcomed what you've done because um, I think part of freedom of expression is definitely being able to, to choose your audience. And, and if you want to broadcast publicly, then I think that should be uh, the choice made by the individual. So, um, Nigel, I uh, welcome your so comments. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Nigel, um, comments. So uh, just to, to return to the question, um, challenges anonymity poses for industry and how uh, I can, in particular now as an organization, uh, meet these challenges? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean there's no doubting that, uh, you know, this, th th this debate is one of balance. And, you know, from what we've heard from the panel, from what we've heard, I'm, I'm sure, from business, from whatever, I mean, you, you know, there's no, there's no absolutes in this game. I mean, in terms of ICANN, what does ICANN do? It manages the top-level domain system. So we get involved in... Uh, anonymity in the sense that uh, if someone wants to register, register a, a domain name address, then do they do it in their own name? Can they do it in someone else's name? Can they remain anonymous? And under the, under the registry agreement we've just uh, concluded, yes, they can remain anonymous. But of course that only goes so far. And it's very important that certain individuals can remain anonymous when they join online groups, when they join sites, when they join whatever, because they might be doing things, protesting in, in their environments or, or doing things where their anonymity is very important to them. The challenge for industry, of course, is that one, it only goes so far. And for a, for a registrar of domain name addresses, depending where that registrar is located, that registrar will be subject to lawful access. I mean, if the police come along and knock on the door and say, you know, we're trying to find a posting that's been made, and there might be good reasons why the police want to find that posting that's been made, or the security forces, or whatever, because as someone, someone on the panel has said, that person might be using their anonymity to, to abuse, or, or, or whatever, so there could be very good reason. On the other hand, of course, they could be using their anonymity to, to do something vital for their community, and therefore there is always going to be a challenge and that is a challenge to industry but as long and you know and I'll finish here but as long as there's transparency and you know we can take this where we and we haven't mentioned transparency but if, the, if people understand the conditions under which their anonymity can be challenged then that you know that is I'm not saying it's okay but at least it's it's a step in the right direction but if they have no idea the conditions under which their anonymity could be I feel your pain, don't uh, worry. Early in the morning as well <laughs> can be challenged. Then 
then the whole edifice of what you're doing collapses because if you if you haven't got that if you haven't got that confidence and it really it doesn't matter whether you're being anonymous or whether you're speaking but if you haven't got that confidence to know what is happening to your information then you're in a really serious position thank you very much for that Nigel and um, I think I think it's true just sort of uh, the idea behind it, I think, is, is maybe an issue for education, educating people about what, it, what is happening to their information. Uh, definitely something that was talked about for those of you who were in the privacy workshop this morning, um, which a lot, of these, a lot of these issues were made, and there's a lot of crossover between the two, and I think a very, very uh, fruitful area of discussion. So, uh, Anna Lucia, Thank if you'd you. like to continue. Uh, I just want to use one uh, word, that, word that one of the young panelists mentioned is trust. Uh, and, and, it's a, and, and the relation with the challenges that we have in the industry. And maybe highlight two, two, is two main issues. Uh, the importance uh, of the tools uh, that are available to protect our information and the location. And uh, it is very important to provide good information to young people and uh, how to uh, um, and provide tools to protect the, our own data. And being anonymous is only one expression of the liberty and the freedom that we have to protect our privacy and to, uh, and to decide uh, or have the options to share the information with different audiences, uh, not the only one. Uh, that I think is a reflects some of the concerns that are included in the survey. And the other one is the, 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 the concerns about what happened with my information and, uh, and, and, and I think that it is, it is very, and the relationship with the govern, government request uh, and the uh, and, uh, security that is very important to and we need the balance. So I think transparency here is very important. Um, for example, well, in 2010 we launched the transparency report, and I think it's something that is, uh, it, it is important for not only for, uh, for the elders like me, <laughs> it's, it's very important for young people to, to have information about the request that, uh, of the data of the citizens. And finally, uh, I want to conclude that it, uh, it reflects import, uh, for us, for the industry, that this kind of service shows a uh, uh, reflecting what is our users uh, thinking, no? And the young people, because sometimes we are thinking, uh, in, uh, we have round tables with people that is, um, I don't know, 30, 40, 50. And, and people that aren't using your services. So exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the future is that uh, young people that is, uh, are using our services and sometimes when we talk about the, uh, I don't know, the games and the avatar, I feel like, uh oh, I'm getting into <laughs> it. So it's, it's very, it's very important to understand and see what do you think, what means an avatar and, and the, and the, uh, and your concerns about your privacy, uh, and the avatar's privacy too. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good thing that we, we conducted the survey then and are participating in this workshop indeed, uh, because we're all very keen to, to tell you what we think of, uh, the services that you provide. Um, that's why we're here after all. Um, as, uh, so just, I think we're, we're going to continue now just, it's a it's a bit of a, a curveball question, but um, Lewis, uh, could anonymity restrict the growth of the internet? Um, it, it's an interesting question, and the the reason I come to you is because I know that uh, through the sort of uh, programming and development that you do, that uh, we're we're just really wondering if you think your su your success, um, you have been very successful. Um, I was very impressed when I read your bio, but uh, your success could it have been limited if you had been anonymous, as in? Uh, were you able to uh, sort of, were, were you better able to uh, promote yourself, as it were, uh, through the using of your real name, m maybe as opposed to a pseudonym or as opposed to just being uh, completely anonymous? Um, uh, any thoughts? So I think it really depends. Um, for example, it would be really important for the growth of the internet, the, the anonymity, because uh, Think about countries such as China, where there is like a uh, censorship. Uh, so they are getting to the internet thanks to to proxies, thanks to Tor, th thanks to thing, things that provide anonymity. So in that respect, uh, anonymity is helping, like uh, you know, growing the internet with new users, new people accessing the, the services. But on the other side, anonymity is, is hurting like the big data movement because. Um, you know, the, the quality of the services that we use nowadays in the internet, uh, 
it depends on the on the data you provide, your input. So for example, um, Google sells me advertisement based on my interest, so it makes the service better. But if you're anonymous, that kind of hurts the quality of the service you are trying to use. So on the one hand, anonymity is helping to grow the I think the, the user base of, of you know the quality of users accessing to the internet and accessing the services, but on the other hand, it's hurting, you know, the big data and all the all the all the back end infrastructure that is uh, gathering information about you to make the services better for you. So I think yeah, I think it helps but on the other side it doesn't help too much. Thanks so much, Lewis. I'm definitely getting a sense of uh, balance, contention there, and I think that's a, a theme that seems to be running through this workshop, something I'm definitely going to try and reflect on and no, definitely will reflect on in the conclusion. Um, so uh, just and speaking of uh, conclusions, uh, we're, we're actually coming to the end of the second part of our discussion right now. Um, so I will... I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask a quick question from earlier, which I didn't mention uh, for fear of time, but it it's it's about the idea of accountability. So again, speaking from uh, a young person's pers young people's perspective, um, when it comes to interacting with our peers online, how accountable we think we are for the things that we say, um, and uh, I'll just find the question again for you. Uh, so uh, this is this one's directed at Jack and Micaiah, and I'm just asking them. If people in, uh, do you or do people in general use anonymous sites to avoid accountability and uh, potential consequences of sharing their views? So, Jack, I think I'll come to you first. Well, um, personally, I, I tend not to be anonymous online, um, as I believe whatever I'm going to say, I would say to anyone, and I would take the consequences of my actions, and I have nothing to hide. I wouldn't shy away from from accountability for that. Um, and more generally, I feel um, people tend to become anonymous to sort of shy away from accountability and, and hide from the consequences of what they say. Um, and this was revealed in our survey by 71% of people um, felt that others are more abusive when they're anonymous online. Um, and this could imply that anonymity provides a mask for people to become someone new and exhibit a different personality to what they would usually be in real life. Thanks, Jack. That's definitely an interesting opinion. Uh, obviously, we would set that against uh, people who use anonymity uh, uh, for activists. Um, activists who use anonymity uh, to protect themselves, but definitely in our social situation, we can see that people um, are less accountable for their actions, especially uh, as the online and offline worlds are the same. I, Nigel mentioned earlier there is no such thing as cyberspace, it's just one space now. Um, discussions that uh, bullying moves from uh, in school, in the playground, to, to on the internet, and uh, people, people can be less accountable for their actions there if they're able to use services anonymously. anonymously. Um, so, um, again, I know you definitely have something to say about this. So, again, uh, avoiding accountability and the potential consequences of consequences of sharing your views. Uh, wh what do you think? Well, is this one? Okay. Well, I don't personally use the internet um, anonymously because it's just not my thing. I like people to know who I am. My friends know what I'm saying, and it's perfectly fine if everyone knows what I'm saying. It's nothing too controversial. But... Um, I will draw from the survey where a female from the Netherlands aged 26 to 35 said that she doesn't want everything I say online to be documented and searchable for the rest of her life and I might change my mind and I think that this shows that people do use anonymous sites to avoid um, accountability but, al but also because um, they have shared a controversial um, taboo but not because, sorry, because they, not just because they've shared a taboo um, view but out of privacy and security for themselves as well. And another lady from Kenya, aged 19 to 25, said that she uses the ability to be anonymous online to discuss issues of sex, early marriage, and other TV subjects. And I think that this shows that um, the use of an anonymity is um, an advantage to her because she's able to express herself when, discuss when discussing certain subjects. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Mikhail. Um, I th I'm aware Simon has something that he would like to, like yeah, to add in. Yeah, I thought to add to this. I th one of the things we see with young people on Facebook is they use our privacy settings and, and change privacy for different things they do on Facebook, far more than older uh, users. And actually, it's very much about audience. So the point that the person from the Netherlands uh, in your survey was saying, I think was it Netherlands or Sweden, um, Actually, the point is, if you use those settings on Facebook, you, everything you say is not publicly searchable by everyone. 
So things you've only shared with a small number of people can only be seen by, with, by those people. So I think that's what we see, particularly young people understand that, and therefore they can be themselves, but be themselves with different groups of people for different kinds of issues. Thanks, Simon. Um, that's a, it's a good comment to make there. Um, Alina, I'm, I'm just going to come to you for a last bit of this section of the discussion. We, we have 10 minutes left at the end uh, for, for comments, but um, personal reflections or experiences about the challenges anonymity poses? Um, well, yeah, it's interesting we were talking about accountability as a good thing, but then that really depends on which country you're talking about. For example, I did, wrote a dissertation about human rights in Guatemala, so about people talking about the, the war and the genocide that occurred, and I really tried to contact them, the human rights activists, but that was not possible because they were anonymous. So, in a sense, that way, anonymity is Anonymity is used to a good way, but on the other hand, because the government doesn't allow them to be who they really are in the real world, which you just, just said doesn't exist, they are limited in expressing their views because I wasn't able to contact them that easily. So in that sense, the role of government is so important in this sense. Did you get your essay on in the end? Yeah, I did. <laughs> good, good. Um, good to hear. Um, so I think, no, the question I had to move into the discussion was do the benefits outweigh the challenges. I think we've heard throughout the discussion this is an emphatic no because you can't really, it, they, you can't, one can't outweigh the other. Both are important. Um, so th there is a balance and this has been reiterated um, time and time again. So comments from the floor now, uh, which we seem to have lots of. Okay, um, Marianne, can we, can we finish Marianne's story? Does anyone mind if we do that first? Because I'm, I'm quite interested. Okay, part three. <laughs> um, I'll give you the, yeah, okay, part three. I feel like Essip. Okay, so Nadia has now come out. She's no longer invisible, and so in a sense she's no longer anonymous because there is a link between anonymity and visibility and invisibility. So um, Huffington Post has um, published articles and things are going very well. But remember, homelessness, particularly in definitional terms, is a pathway in and out of various sorts of homelessness. By this time, she and her mum had found accommodation. She was in and out of homelessness twice. As she became more stable in her life and her mother was more stable because this had a very traumatic effect on both of them, they found somewhere safe to live, um, she started to think about being once homeless girl, her persona. And then she was becoming less and less um, in, in, in enthusiastic about all the unwanted attention she was getting. And this is my point with this part three. Her own community started to get a hold of her once they knew who she was with her last name now is now being used, which I will not give. Um, and she was getting some very unpleasant uh, responses from her, her community. Very upsetting. So coming out to owning being homeless, showing that you can you can you can become non homeless, you can get out of the situation by using your full name and being out there and her real person. Once homeless girl now Nadia with her last name decided this was enough. And she has just recently decided to um, discontinue her Twitter feed, discontinue her blog, and um, return to anonymity in the sense that she asked the Huffington Post to take down her articles because she wanted to retreat from this unwanted visibility. And that took some time. I had to offer her legal advice via phones. Fortunately, she managed to persuade Huffington Post to take down her articles. This is another story again. They did, which was good. She is now discontinued. She's now blogging under another name, herself. And in terms of my publication of her story, we conferred and she said, could I please, because I was working with her visibility option, could I take away her surname? She's still very concerned about being pursued about her community, by a community who do not like hearing that a member of their community has been homeless. She is no longer homeless. She's um, done her GS, she's done her A-levels. She's going to go to university and she's going to make a thing of it. So she has experienced the double side of um, the double-edged sword that we are talking about today. But I'll leave others comment because the moral of the story will pop in at this time. My sense of the moral of the story. I hope that was clear. Nadia, very, very brave young woman. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, that was a really intriguing story, and and thank you for sharing it. I think it's given us all something to talk about. So, to move on into the discussion, then uh, comments from the floor. Okay. Uh, so uh, at the back, and then over here. 
Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Andy. I represent and belongs to Aerotex Indonesia and hopefully I can pre present my other Indonesian colleagues here. So I do agree uh, with this. Uh, this debate is not being, uh, it's not whether being anonymous or not is good or, uh, ba uh, or bad, but I think that the best thing that we have to concern of the impacts of the, the disadvantage or the challenge of being anonymous or not. So here we're discussing that using the internet as a part of our life, we have to I agree that we have to educate the people who use that. So when they be anonymous, they still uh, were using human rights as a basis, as a platform, or as a perspective. So we know that we're not going to violence uh, other uh, uh, rights, for example, like that. Because in our case, that for example, uh, the women who are living with IHV and AIDS and also the LGBT groups, as we know that this is the marginalized group here in Indonesia, we found that being anonymous or not is not the issues here, but then whether we still use, uh, we don't use our name or being uh, anonymous, we still what is it, get uh, violence and blockage by, uh, I don't know, who's going to blockage our website for something like that. And the second one is like, because here we know that there are representing of the industry uh, uh, side, we do believe that the info uh, involvement of the multi-stakeholder, including uh, industrial uh, aspect, is very important here because we know that we are using the social media made by Facebook, Twitter, and so on and so forth, and then we don't not really understand whether they use the human rights as their platform to what is it to protect our rights as a human. And the second one is very important when we know the social result is here uh, you say that 86% said that it was important to people who were able to anonymous online if they want. But I wanna want to know more that is it is it any further what is this data that it will say that uh, it's not only about anonymous but it's um, more than uh, what is the uh, what is what is the solution if then we get uh, for example, receive anonymous abuse online and then may be necessary if uh, it will be anonymous. So I want to know whether there is a solution or data after you do this uh, result. Yes, okay. Thank well, you very much. There wasn't anything in our survey specifically about solutions to the problem, but I'm sure um, everyone here will have their own idea about solutions to the problem anonymity, anonymity poses. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, in order to safeguard anonymity is a right. Um, so, remote moderator? Uh, well, well, we'll take the comment in the back and then the remote moderator, with, uh, remote participant would like okay. to make something. So, uh, please continue. Hi, my name is Anthony Bouch. Uh, I'm a consultant working for Internews in Bangkok, Thailand, and I work in the area of uh, cybersecurity and information security. Uh, on the topic of behavior and accountability, I think it does depend on context, and I don't believe it automatically removes social norms or that it's an, uh, necessarily an attempt to evade accountability. And I'd like to suggest to the panelists that perhaps identity is in fact defined by um, a set of shared values and behaviors, whether using a real name or a pseudonym, um, and that within a given online community, it's the protections offered by or afforded to that community that set the stage for participation and behavior, uh, whether for individuals having fun or seeking medical advice or for journalists attempting to defend human rights. Um, so I'd also, if you don't mind, Jack, I'd like to suggest that perhaps your confidence in using your real name and taking responsibility for your behaviors online stem in part from those protections and the protections that you benefit from in the part of the world that, that you currently live in. And so um, protections, shared values, and identity, I think, are an interesting topic and, and perhaps as if not more relevant than whether anonymity is actually a good or bad or the pros and cons of anonymity uh, in isolation. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, does anyone, we've got one from the remote participant. Uh, it just to know, is there any other comments from the floor? Uh, uh, Louise, I'll come to you. Hi there. Um, so we've got one comment from Charlie Sakida, who's based in the Philippines and who's part of the Peace and Conflict Journalism Network. Um, and he's asking that there are a lot of issues out there that need to be reported in the media, but the media's challenge on anonymity is that we don't have a named source in the case, which is important because it provides accountability and credibility. 
Also, when the media reports on anonymous sources, the danger can be transferred from the anonymous source to the journalist who reported it. Any thoughts, perhaps from the um, uh, from Donny Boo or any of the other panelists? Does anyone have comments they want to make on that one? Um, so, any of the industry panelists, or Marianne, would, do you have anything you want to say there? Do you want to uh, maybe repeat it just again, Hannah, and, and briefly? Um, Bonnie, I think this question was ad addressed to you, but uh, just a brief. Yeah, or if anyone in the audience wants to comment, um, how the media can find it difficult to source anonymous um, kind of quotes they're getting or references about stories. So, how do they um, kind of show the credibility when anonymous users are rep reporting something to them? Well, I think Alina definitely uh, struggled with that one when writing your essay. Just yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I don't. What What do we actually mean by the media? Are we talking about the old-fashioned media, the TV, who wants to have a real person online, or do we talk about media in a more modern sense? Because then anonymous bloggers, I think that's not a problem at all. There, it's a really popular tool and becoming more and more important. So. I don't, I don't see the problem. Maybe it is still a problem for old-fashioned media, but, well, they have a lot of problems. So, sorry. Um. Thanks very much. Uh, Marianne and Ronnie, I see comments from both of you, sir. I think Reporters Without Borders are a source here for inspiration and ideas. Our media freedom in the UK, at least, certainly in the wake of something called the Leveson Inquiry, is that the right to keep your sources anonymous is part of journalistic ethics in old fashioned media and the right to and the right to protect journalists in the new fashioned media, namely online bloggers, is becoming more and more um, recognised. So we're really at the cutting edge of thinking about these things. But reporters without borders and some of the work being done for social uh, citizen um, citizen um, Journalist, is, I think it's a very important point of intersection. But these things are not self-explanatory. But anonymous sources do not necessarily discredit. The reporting has to be done with following journalistic ethics in new and old-fashioned forms. Uh, Donnie, would you like to... Um, sorry. And, and Nigel, uh, is there a comment you'd like to make? Yeah, there, to? There's some, uh, some cases in Indonesia that uh, several mainstream media, they quote uh, the source anonymously. Even they quote from the uh, anonymous uh, anonymous uh, uh, source. So quote the, the quoting the, the 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 source person anonymously is different with quoting the anonymous uh, the source. But there's a several cases when the uh, uh, mainstream media they quote from the anonymous uh, the source uh, person. So it it not about Again, it's not about the anonymous or pseudonym or anonymity. It's about the credibility of the source. When information uh, 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 relies on the internet and it uh, has the credibility, it, how to count, how to the credit, how how to understand this source anonymous is credible or not is is depends so many ways. For example, from the content itself, also from, for example, if you're using Twitter, is from the followers or from the response from of the followers. So yes, I think we can answer. definitely see that. Um, so I hope the remote participant got their uh, response they were looking for. So now, just, I see. Could I, I mean, just, just 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 very briefly on this. I mean, this, this is just in, I mean, incredibly important, but. Again, it's, it's, an, it's an issue of confidence, and whether it's old media or, or, or new media, I mean, the journalistic experience is, is absolutely critical that sources can remain anonymous, and that there has to be confidence in, com, confidence in the legislative framework of, a, of a, where the journalist or where the publication is based, that that should happen. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I think a final comment from the floor, then. I see uh, someone a few years back could like would like to make a point. Well, well actually, uh, my name is Miss Wan, and I come from uh, Small Wars in Cambodia. I don't know whether how many of you here know Cambodia. <laughs> All right. Um, regarding to the technology in Cambodia, it's just um, quite new to Cambodian people, and uh, the people who can access to the internet, it's just in the capital city and uh, the town who can access the internet. And uh, currently, uh, most of the young generation, they uh, 
uh, actively participate in uh, disseminate information and sharing information about the political and that they even don't know about how to uh, protect themselves from sharing those in kind of information. So um, my question is just like I want to ask you the is your project that provides some you know uh, some kind of training courses to you know, target uh, uh, communities or citizen journalists and uh, or the ways of uh, people we can say that the citizen journalists because they will share the information than the something else and then so if your organization or other organization here provide you know, some uh, training courses about uh, online safety or uh, at least uh, online video that they can, uh, the community people can learn from that. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. So yeah, um, the organization that we're part of, Southern International, I'm sure they would be glad to talk to you, especially in regards to online safety. Um, it, it's what they do. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure you'll get uh, lots of response at the end. So, um, so I think that's everything. Um, I'm aware there are some people that haven't come to that I did intend to, but um, I think it. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll conclude because. Oh, we're five minutes over. I'm sorry, everyone. You probably want to go to lunch. Um, so, conclusion. Um, I'm really bad at this bit. Sorry. Uh, but sort of what we saw really here was the uh, the survey results that we've been mentioning through a, a sort of a, as far as the benefits and the challenges are concerned. We definitely saw benefit on um, a peer to peer level. The anonymity uh, protects people. Uh, it protects people from uh, the societal norms that we're talking about. Um, and it was mentioned earlier on that that, that might just be sort of a uh, codes of uh, conduct within sort of um, a specific place. I'm not entirely sure uh, about the theory that you're working on there. Um, I didn't pick it up completely, but I'd be really interested to talk to you about that at the end, as I'm sure other people would do too. Um, uh, maybe a wider context to set this discussion in. Um, and on a peer to peer level, we can definitely see that there are benefits uh, to anonymity. Um, you know, we've mentioned uh, sort of the LGBT uh, community um, uh, act uh, being, uh, being activists and um, and uh, human rights bloggers for whom anonymity protects them. It's a ne necessity. Uh, it, it really is a life or death situation. However, on the other hand, we also see uh, the challenges anonymity poses, that um, people do use it to evade accountability um, and uh, uh, for, for other reasons too. So what we really need to ask ourselves is how do we meet the challenges anonymity poses? So I think a part of that is it's, it's always education because when we see 86% of our respondents agreed that we have to have anonymity, that is necessary, that we want it there, at least on some services, maybe not on others. Um, it, it really does depend on the context and the platform. Um, but then we really do we need to educate people um, about its uses, uh, how to use it well. And, and I think that, uh, that that is being done now. It should be, be done more in the future. And, and asking people about, about ways that they can solve the problems um, that they see uh, in their day-to-day -day lives um, that anonymity causes uh, so we can improve and uh, make sure that the benefits really shine through. So thank you very, very much for uh, coming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>